Welcome to The Real News Network, and welcome to Reality Asserts Itself. I'm Paul Jay. Usually on Reality Asserts Itself, we start with a kind of biographical uh, uh, story of our guest, but we're going to go a little differently this time. We're going to deal with some more of the news and, and take and our analytical take on it, because the news is just so pressing about what we're going to talk about. And what we're going to discuss is the United States' attitude towards Iran. If there's one thing the Trump administration falls, foreign policy has been clear about, and there's been a lot of ambiguity about just what its foreign policy really is, the one thing it has been clear about is its hostility to Iran. And we're going to try to understand why, because it's not just the, the Trump administration. It was pretty much the same for all American administrations since the Iranian Revolution. So now joining us to discuss this, and particularly today, our first segment, because tonight, and as we record this, President Trump is going to make a statement on Afghanistan. So we're going to start, because of that, we're going to start with U.S.-Iranian relations as it relates to American policy in Afghanistan. So now joining us in the studio is Trita Parsi. Trita is founder and president of the National Iranian American Council. He's the author of the award-winning books, A Single Roll of the Dice, Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, and Treacherous Alliance, The Secret Dealings of Israel, Iran, and the U.S. His most recent book is Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So yesterday, the Washington Post uh, had an editorial. And while it recognized that the nuclear agreement is working and Iran is abiding by its side of the agreement, it harshly critiques uh, the Trump administration, strangely enough, for not confronting Iran in terms of its, uh, the Iranian influence in Iraq, the Iranian influence in uh, uh, Afghanistan, and for allowing its allies to fight a useless war in Yemen mostly that the Trump administration is not being aggressive enough. So I'm just going to read the first, paragra first paragraph of the Washington Post piece. Despite much heated rhetoric, the Trump administration is doing little to counter Iranian aggression. In Syria, its strategy of striking deals with Russia has opened the way for Tehran's forces to establish control over a corridor between Damascus and Baghdad. In Afghanistan, Iran is steadily building a strategic position even as President Trump box at a plan to strengthen U.S. support for the Afghan government. Well, combine this with the New York Times, which has just recently had several articles about, first of all, Iranian domination of Iraq, and then it talks about the Iranians are now supporting sections in, of the Taliban and arming and training them. Uh, the drumbeats coming from the New York Times and the Washington Post, strangely enough, are even more aggressive than what's been coming from the Trump administration. What do you make of all this? Well, in the book, I do describe and explain that at the end of the day, this nuclear deal was about so much more than just a nuclear issue. Ultimately, it was about whether the United States would recognize Iran as a major player in the region or whether it would continue a more than three decade long policy of almost total isolation and containment of Iran. The nuclear deal essentially, by virtue of being a deal with Tehran, put an end to that. And the Obama administration was actually actively working to make sure that Iran had a seat at the table when there were negotiations about Syria, et cetera. The real opposition that came both from the Saudis as well as the Israelis was primarily because not of the deal itself, not of the details of the deal, but the geopolitical repercussions of the United States no longer being a lethal enemy of Iran, but recognizing that whether we like it or not, Iran is a major power in the region and you have to deal with it and you have to recognize that it does also have legitimate interest. Now we're seeing all of these articles and commentary coming out that frankly is a little bit more honest about some of the opposition that existed against the deal. Because what they're afraid of and what they're arguing that the United States should be much more aggressive about is that just because there's a nuclear deal does not mean that the United States should not confront Iran in Syria, should not confront uh, Iran in uh, Yemen or in Iraq. So we're seeing that it's coming to the core of what is the U.S.'s own role in the region. Should it continue to have a position of hard hegemony in the region in which it automatically will be on the opposite side of Iran and on the side of Saudi Arabia and Israel who has been the main benefactors of U.S. hegemony in the past? Or should it pursue a policy in which it actually recognizes that there's plenty of uh, blame to go around in the Middle East and all of these major powers need to find a way to get along and resolve their 
uh, differences, instead of them thinking that they can use the United States as a proxy in order to score goal, uh, points in their own internal rivalries. That's what this really is about at this point. And we're seeing that some folks may not have fully recognized the, the repercussions of the deal, and now they're quite much, uh, perhaps we can say, overreacting to some of the realities that was quite inevitable that would come with this deal. Well, let's, let's because of the Trump statement that's coming, which we assume is going to support a certain number of more troops, they've been kicking around 4,000 extra uh, troops going to Afghanistan. Uh, there's some talk of the American uh, military, Pentagon, actually want to even have much more significant troop increases in Afghanistan. Um, let's talk about that. Now, the New York Times a couple of weeks ago had an article that talked about the Iran, apparently, according to New York Times, is training sections of the Taliban, which is somewhat counterintuitive because of the, the supposed Sunni Shia division. Uh, but according to this article, in spite of that, Iran is now using sections of the Taliban to weaken the American position in Afghanistan. And as it's said in that Washington Post article create a kind of beachhead for Iran in Afghanistan. What do you make of that? Well, I think if we talk about Afghanistan in particular, we have to remember that the United States and Iran worked closely together to defeat the Taliban. The Iranians had been opposed to the Taliban even at times when some U.S. money was going to elements there. Uh, and the Iranians were very upset just a couple of years ago when the U.S. was softening its position on the Taliban and argued that the Taliban should be negotiated with. The Iranians were very much against that. I think what has happened in Iraq and Afghanistan that explain some of the difference in the Iranian posture vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan compared to Iraq. Is that in Iraq, the Iranians were successful in pressuring the Iraqi government not to agree to a status of forces agreement with the United States, SOFA, that would enable the United States to have its troops in Iraq and be above Iraqi law. Once that SOFA wasn't uh, signed, the Obama administration felt that it would be too risky to have a very heavy military presence there. In Afghanistan, the Iranians failed, and the Afghan government did sign a status of forces agreement. And as a result, it is much easier for the United States to have troops there, much less costly in, in terms of political and legal uh, aspects of it, and potentially even have permanent bases there, particularly because of the very s intense hostility between the United States and Iran, which under Trump has intensified. The Iranians do not want to have e American troops anywhere near their borders. So it would not be that uh, contradictory to past patterns that the Iranians would pursue policies in Afghanistan that would undermine the U.S.'s position there precisely because they don't want the United States to have an ability to attack Iran from Afghanistan or from Iraq. I mean, let's not forget, and for some of the younger viewers that may not know the history, uh, it was American policy that helped create the Taliban in the first place. Uh, this is the Brzezinski and Carter policy of sucking the Russians into this, what was supposed to be Russia's Vietnam. I guess in some ways it was. Um, but the Taliban, uh, through the Pakistani ISI and the CIA, was very much a creature of American policy. Ronald Reagan called them heroes. And uh, Iran, this is a, a, a great threat to Iran to have this kind of fundamentalist Shia power uh, in, in, in Afghanistan. Um, but what it does show is that to the extent that U.S.-Iran tensions are going in a negative direction, wherever the two actually end up in the same arena, it will lead those, to those arenas becoming intense areas of competition and rivalry between the United States and Iran. If this wasn't the case, if the Trump administration had pursued a different policy and if the military option against Iran had really been taken off the table, I suspect that we could have seen a very different posture by the Iranians in Afghanistan, as we have seen in elsewhere when the U.S. and Iran actually collaborated. But the more we're going in a negative direction, unfortunately, I think it is quite likely that the Iranians are going to set aside ideological differences and work towards ensuring that the U.S. never ends up in a position in which it would be able to take military action against Iran from areas very close to its borders. Which, of course, includes Iraq. There's also a New York Times piece about how Iran is asserting, asserting its domi domination in Iraq and so on. Uh, but I, I guess for some of the same reasons, and, and there's, in fact, uh, we've several times quoted Trump. Uh, uh, he spoke at the CIA just after his inauguration where he kind of jokes about how America should have kept the oil in Iraq, and then he jokes to the CIA, I think you're going to get another chance to go get that oil. I mean, openly talking about going back into Iraq, which would, to seize the oil, if, if they're serious about that, you've got to go back in some numbers. 
uh, but mostly it seems to be they want to counter Iranian influence in Iraq. So, you know, a lot of other countries in the region are very frustrated with the United States because they believe that by going into Iraq in the first place uh, and the taking out the Taliban, uh, the United States is quite guilty of unleashing Iran because these are two powers that were essentially balancing which, which, Iran. Which most of the people that knew the region said prior to the invasion that they, that's what was going to happen. And, and in fact, the Saudis were very explicit in warning the George W. Bush administration that if you go into Iraq, uh, you are going to essentially end up increasing Iranian influence. Uh, one Saudi official very angrily told me that the Americans gave, Iran, uh, gave Iraq to Iran on a silver platter. Reality is, though, that because the U.S. has failure in Iraq, the vacuum was created. Uh, and various parties, including the Saudis, have been vying for control and influence there. And they've largely all lost out to the Iranians who have been more effective, more cle clever, and actually particularly much better at taking advantage of the other side's mistakes. It's not so much that they had the smartest strategy, it's just that their strategy wasn't as uh, incompetent as the strategy of others. And as a result, they've been winning out. Ultimately, though, I think it's going to be very difficult for the Iranians to retain that degree of influence in Iraq. Iran and Iraq, historically, just because of geopolitical realities, have oftentimes been rivals rather than partners. But the panic we're seeing right now over the idea that Iran is gaining influence in these various areas is actually going back to a question that is rarely openly discussed in Washington, D.C. Does the United States want to be the hegemon in the Middle East? Is that just taken for granted? And, and if so, if it actually explicitly wants to be the hegemon in the Middle East, what is the cost and what is the benefit? What is the cost-benefit analysis there? The Obama administration actually was quite clear on this point. They believed that the Middle East had lost a tremendous amount of strategic significance for a whole set of reasons, including, of course, that the value of the oil there had uh, uh, declined as a result of the U.S. being able to produce much more through shale oil, et cetera. Moreover, the administration under Obama felt that the real challenge to the United States would not come from any country or movement out of the Middle East, but it would come from China. And that the United States was being overextended in the Middle East and undercommitted in East Asia. And they wanted to pivot to Asia. So they very explicitly told the Saudis, for instance, the president did, that the United States is tr trying to resolve its tensions with Iran. And he suggested to the Saudis, you should do so as well. But the Saudi position was, no, we want you to be the hegemon in the Middle East. Yes, you will pay for it through your blood uh, and treasure, but we'll cover some of that treasure at least. Uh, but we want to be under an American hegemonic umbrella. And this is where we clearly see that there's a divergence of interest from a global perspective between the United States and some of its core allies in the region. S sections of the United States. Exactly. Sections exactly. of the foreign policy You're quite establishment, right. You're quite sections right. of capital, yeah. because the fossil fuel industry, uh, I think, and I, the people I've ta interviewed and talked to, they want another play in Iraq, because there's so much sweet crude unexploited in Iraq. Without a doubt, you're correct in saying that there's sections that want this and there's sections that actually still want The longer-term play yeah. is about China, but the shorter-term play, and that seems where the Trump administration is focused, is on the energy side. And the energy side is go back and get the oil from, from Iraq. Um, it's the alliance with the Saudis, and it also has its own metaphysical, ideological side. You know, Steve Bannon's articulated it the best, but it sounds like Trump believes in this stuff. Because this fight against Islamic terrorism, Islamic fascism, it's really a misnomer. Mm. Because you don't, if you're really against Islamic fascism and Islamic terrorism, you would focus on the Saudis. Sorry. This is all anti-Iranian rhetoric dressed up as anti-Islamic terrorism. So the, but the, the whole part of it that is still not clear to me, though. I, I agree with what you say, that you know, several elements still want that hegemony. Why they want it is not entirely clear to me. If it is because of the Short-term money. Well, that's where the cost-benefit analysis doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, it depends if you're talking about the systemic interests of the United States or the narrow interest of a narrow sector of capital. A narrow interest that would perhaps be as narrow as the Trump administration's own Trump investments, perhaps, yes. Because or, or Tillerson's Exxon or, you know, I mean, this is, this, there's certain sections of capital there, especially if you're fossil fuel, because you've but only got But I don't think it's only them. What we have is also folks in the Pentagon that without any connection to these other types of interests seem to have uh, an approach and a definition of the interest in which it doesn't matter how valuable the Middle East is right now, we simply don't retreat. 
That's not what we do. I agree with that. That's a yeah. big deal. We don't lose. We don't lose. We, we just never take a step back. And it doesn't matter how negative the cost-benefit analysis is. They just don't want to do it. Whereas I think the calculation on the Obama side was is that this doesn't make a lot of sense any longer. We are actually keeping our eye off the ball by not focusing on Asia and we need to shift over there. And Iran was a very critical piece because one can criticize uh, Obama on several different points. And one criticism that the Hawks give is that he never went into Syria. Uh, and he had promised to or he had the red line. But Syria was never as dangerous from the Obama perspective in the sense of being able to drag them into yet another unwinnable Middle Eastern war as Iran and the nuclear program was. The fear that the nuclear program would lead to a military confrontation that would drag the United States in it to something that the president clearly didn't believe would have a long-term military solution was so much uh, bigger. And that's why the Obama administration ended up spending so much political capital in trying to get a deal on the nuclear issue. Because it was a critical piece in, in at least trying to make sure that the pivot to Asia would work. Well, it's interesting in that Washington Post piece that I quoted up front, mm -hmm. it defends the deal. And it says the Iranians are abiding by the deal, and it actually critiques the Trump administration while it says it's not being aggressive enough on uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. It critiques them for wanting to undermine the, the nuclear deal. Uh, so, so even the hawks defend the deal. And, and this is where there's a disconnect in my view. There is a belief that you can keep the deal and be even more aggressive on other issues. The deal by design or not by design, nevertheless, constrains both sides. It constrains the Iranian on non-nuclear issues, and it constrains the United States as well. The idea that the United States could adopt a much, much more hawkish policy in the region and push back against Iran here and there and still be able to keep the nuclear deal, I don't think is feasible. I think in order to be able to ensure that this deal lasts a minimum of those 15 years, there has to be a positive trajectory uh, on, in U.S.-Iran relations because as a whole. But, but here's the thing. That does not mean that the United States necessarily would have to accept uh, some of Iran's policies in the region. There probably are areas in which there should be pushback, et cetera. But we now have a blueprint in which we can see what is effective with the Iranians and what is not. We have no other example in which the United States has been able to engage in a process that dramatically changed Iran's policy, except for the nuclear negotiations. We have a successful case, and the Trump administration right now, as well as many of the commentators, whether it is in New York Times or Washington Post, are advocating for a completely different approach, an approach of confrontation uh, and, and pressure that has never worked anywhere with the Iranians. This is the mystery to me. If we truly want to see a change in Iranian policy in the region, whether it's in Syria, Iraq, or Yemen, there is a negotiated path in which that can be achieved. But it requires something that I think very few people in Washington are willing to accept. For the Iranians to change their policy, as they did on the nuclear policy issue, the United States also needs to change its policy, as it did on the nuclear issue. It has to be a compromise. It has to be a give and take. But Washington is rarely in a compromising mood. I mean, I think what happens is that the section of foreign policy establishment and capital that was previously best represented by Dick Cheney, their play is short term. It's about fossil fuel. It's about military industrial complex. And it's not the long term systemic global power play. Because if you really had that vision, you never would have invaded Iraq. In fact, Obama said that. Uh, I believe in the first, uh, in the, in the first presidential election. Um, he said, someone was asked about accepting, would you accept Iran as a regional power? And he said, well, it's too late for that question, because if you didn't want to accept Iran as a regional power, you shouldn't have invaded Iraq. That horse has left the barn. But let's just stop so there. So he accepts yeah, it. But let's just stop there. How could that even be a question? Are you willing to accept Iran as a regional we're talking power? to the global We're talking about, about the problem here is the tremendous unrealistic positions that has been taken by the United States and others when it comes to Iran. Iran is a giant in the region. There's never been a su sustainable, stable order in the region that did not include either them or any other country of that size. We see that in, in the European experience. Ultimately, in order to be able to have stability in Europe, Germany had to be one of the pillars of that stability. 
any effort to exclude it would uh, spell disaster. Whether the Germans are right or wrong is a different story. The story is you cannot have a regional order that is sustainable and indigenous, meaning that it can stand on its own legs without having the core powerful states in the region be included and be pillars of that. So the idea that one could have a, a prolonged uh, state of balance of power in the region, an equilibrium that is based on Iran's exclusion, would only work if the United States pays for it with its blood and treasure. And even then, it would still have a very short uh, uh, expiration date. But that's exactly what the Saudis and the Israelis wanted the United States to continue to do. After the Iraq war, it became quite clear. The United States had weakened itself to the extent that it no longer could reestablish such an order. And that's where you see a significant divergence between Israel and Saudi Arabia on one hand and the United States on the other hand. Sections of the United States. Sections of the United States. Because the Cheney philosophy is back in power. It is. There is that philosophy to saying that, well, the only reason why we, it hasn't worked is because we haven't been tough enough. We haven't poured enough money and military means onto this problem. Yeah, they, if they, we just did that, it would work. They, they're, the reason Iran filled the vacuum is because the vacuum was created by pulling out American troops, according to this line of thinking. Yeah. Keep a ma massive American troop presence in Iraq, Iran never gets that position. The answer is get troops back in. Uh, you know, you talk about not backing up. And, and, and here's, I have to say, to some extent, I, I'm not entirely sure whether this is driven by fossil fuel industry centra. I think it's many factors. But one of the core factors that have always been there and are very visible is that that's the line of some of the allies of the United States in the region who have been the main benefactors of U.S. hegemony in the region. They look back to the era pre-2003 with tremendous nostalgia because that's the point in which the U.S. was strong enough that it was isolating Iraq and Iran. It was relatively stable, particularly compared to today. And in their view, although not all of them are saying it explicitly, it was the United States that destroyed that order by going into Iraq in the first place. Uh, the, the, it seems the plan, and, and they openly articulated, they being some of the Trump foreign policy spokespeople and certainly people in Congress who are on this page and Steve Bannon types, they, I think they believe that they can create in Iran another Iraq. In other words, destabilize, unleash civil war, and try to destroy that society with bringing back sanctions. I mean, the reason for undoing the, the nuclear deal is not because they think they haven't, Iran hasn't abided by it, is they want sanctions. They want to destroy the economy. They want to create the grounds for turmoil in Iran. And, and why? So in the next segment of our interview, we'll talk about just what this strategy looks like and, and, and just how real is it, because they, they thought they, they'd win in Iraq and that didn't work out so well. So please join us for the next segment of Reality Asserts Itself with Trita Parsi on The Real News Network.